Well, just like the previous speaker, I'm also fond of doing research, and I would like to start right away. I would like to ask you to raise hands if you ever ate insects. Wow. <laughs> it's seldom that I'm in front of an audience like this. <laughs> it's a very experienced audience, then. Let's see at the end where I can tell you something new. When we're looking at insects, then usually I try to tell that insects are animals that are not yucky animals, but that insects are animals that are all around us, and that there's about six million species, and that, in fact, if we look at biodiversity on this earth, that we look at insects. There's about six million species of insects. There's one species of humans. In fact, of all animals, about 80% walks on six legs, 80% of the species. And if we calculate the biomass of all insects, then we are not the dominating species on this earth, but insects are. For each of you and me, there's about 200 to 2,000 kilograms. So in fact, we are not on the earth of the human species, but we're on the, on the planet of insects. And we just hitchhike along. Insects were there before us, and insects will, there, will be there after us. You might think, well, that's something out there in nature where there's no technology. No, it's also where there's technology. Even insects contribute to our economy. There was a calculation a couple of years ago that insects, naturally occurring, contribute to the US economy with 57 billion Euro, uh, dollars per year. Now, that's a number that's very difficult for me to grasp. I know there's people in the audience that know what 57 billion euros is, or dollars. Well, just to put that into perspective, the US Army spends about, spent in 2006 about 80 billion dollars in Iraq. And we know that was not a cheap war. So insects contribute to the US economy in an enormous way. And they do that to our economy, to any economy in the world. How do they do, they do this? Insects remove our poo. We don't all have to go to the neo toilet to donate our poo there. Insects will take it away anyway. Insects pollinate our crops. Every apple, every orange, every banana, and I could go on, that you eat was the product of insects taking care of the sex of plants. They avoid pests being there. And they're food for animals. Food for little shrews, food for little birds that have been eaten by larger birds, etc. Now, if insects provide food for birds and little mammals, why not for us? Here you see a dish that you can get in an ordinary restaurant in Hangzhou, China. It's just on the menu, and it's a dish of silkworm pupae. And it's one out of 1,400 different species of insects that are on the menu somewhere on the globe. Now, a lot of people that I talk to will say, well, maybe somewhere in this unknown town in China that has six million inhabitants. <laughs> but we? No way. Well, for anyone that did not raise the hand yet, I have some news. You too. Every one of you at least eats up to 500 grams of insects per year. How? If you like tomato soup, peanut butter, applesauce, chocolate, anything that's processed will contain insects. The tomato soup is not made of the same tomatoes that you use for your tomato salad. The tomatoes that go for your tomato salad should look as if there's no insect in there. The tomatoes that might have one here and there will end up in the soup. <laughs> in fact, there's upper limits legally set of how many insect pieces can be in the soup. So in fact, you don't need the balls in the soup. The meat is there anyway. Well, there you might say, well, that's just something. Insects are everywhere, so also in our food. We even put them in deliberately. Dutch people like, especially school kids, roze koeken. 
pink cookies. Or you might like surimi sticks, white fish that is colored with a red dye in order to make it look like crab meat. It's dyed with an insect product. It's dyed with an extract made from an insect that lives on prickly pear cactus. In Peru, on the Canary Islands, and it's produced up till 150 to 180 million uh, metric tons per year. And at a good price, one gram of this cochineal, which is E120, and as soon as you see E120 on the food label, you can be assured this is cochineal. It's not an artificial dye, it's coming from Peru or the Canary Islands. One gram of cochineal costs 30 euros. The price of gold is around 25. So producing these insects is better than to digging gold in the mines. So we're eating them. And we're going to eat more. If we look at population growth, as we mentioned several times today already, we're on the increase, on a rapid increase. We have about six to seven billion people at the moment, and we're expecting about nine, maybe 10 mil billion in about 40 years from now. And so last month, there was a conference of the FAO, the Food and Agricultural Organization, that said that there's an increase in agricultural production needed. There's a third more mouth to feed, which means, according to the FAO, and I agree with them, that we need 70% more food. A third more mouth, but 70% more food. I'll come back to that. What do we need to feed these people with? Well, not only with vegetables. We'll also need some form of animal proteins. What kind of animal proteins do we get? Well, we have livestock, we have fish, we have game. That's the main sources that we use. When we look here, or in North America, then each of us consumes about 80 kilograms per head on meat per year. But in countries like China and India, it's about 25. However, with an increase of the standard of living, it's going to increase. And if, two thir if one third of the world population, that is India and China, would increase to the same rate of animal protein intake that we have, there would not be enough meat with current practice of producing meat. Moreover, in the first place, we eat too much meat here. We, would, we shouldn't have this as a standard, at least we should not be proud of this standard. It's way too much. For a second thing, there's simply a lot of problems that come with producing meat. The first thing is human health. If we raise pigs, pigs are susceptible to viruses that only infest pigs, but they can only be susceptible, also be susceptible to viruses that infect us. And if two of these viruses infect the same pig at the same time, their way of reproduction can make that they recombine into a new virus, and this new virus might also infect us. That's a serious health danger, and we've seen some of these issues in the Netherlands in the late 1990s. In insects, that are so distant related from us, because pigs are very closely related to us, especially in a medical way, in insects, this will not happen, because they're so distant related from us. That's one point for insects. <laughs> then there's the conversion factor. If you take 10 kilogram of feed, and you're going to feed it to cows, pigs, chicken, or insects, you'll end up with one kilogram of beef, three of pork, five of chicken, and nine of insects. What happens with the rest? Poo. The rest is just waste. So in fact, if you want to be effective, if you would talk to any entrepreneur, you would say, well, I choose the last way, because that's raising the best product on the best input, on the input. Two points for insects. The poo is less poo with insects. Only one kilogram of poo on nine kilogram of insects. So less poo, and the poo that they produce produces less bad tox uh, compounds for uh, the, the, the greenhouse products. Less ammonia, 
and less other greenhouse products. So better for the environment. Three points for insects. The quality is excellent. In terms of proteins, the amount, digestibility, in terms of fat, in terms of minerals, in terms of vitamins, it's excellent food that really compares to beef, pork, chicken, etc. In calories, it's excellent as well. One kilogram of grasshoppers is the same in calories as 10 hot dogs or six Big Macs. I know what I would prefer. Four points for insects. I'll stop there. Why not eat insects? Well, we'll have to. At least if we want to continue to intake, to take in animal proteins. Livestock production at this moment accounts for 70% of agricultural land in the world. Okay, we could increase that a bit, but not too much, because we will need also to produce other things than livestock. We could increase the agricultural land. Well, that could increase a bit. It would mean deforestation, but soon the limit would be there as well. So there's very little potential for increasing livestock production. And then 80% of the world already eats insects, and not because they're hungry, but because they think it's a delicacy. 1,400 different species. And to them, a locust is a delicacy. We have a similar kind of delicacy. A shrimp. Not six legs, but ten legs. Insects are just the shrimp of the land. <laughs> so why not? Why do we not eat insects in North America and Europe? That's a matter of mindset. It's all here. It's usually because we don't appreciate insects as much. The word insect usually does not mean that someone is talking about something that's very positive. Still, it should be. We just have to get used to the idea. And some would say that they're not yet available. But they are. They're on the market. Mealworms, bigger mealworms, locusts. So no excuse not to eat them, being produced in the Netherlands. Since my colleague Arnold van Huys started to promote eating insects, it really has gone fast in the last 12 years, but especially in the last three years. There's innovative entrepreneurs in the Netherlands that produce insects for human consumption. And not just small containers. Look at all the crates, large amounts. I predict that soon we really can eat them, if you like, before it's necessary to do so. In the first place, maybe already next year, in a version that you will not recognize, that maybe on the plates you'll see insects, but you don't know that there's insects in there because you didn't read the label well. <laughs> it said there were animal proteins in there. <laughs> but within 10 years, I predict that you will buy them knowing that they're insects <laughs> and seeing that they're there. I'll be happy to come back in 10 years and see what it comes through. We have a very entrepreneurial minister of agriculture who is a minister of cows, pigs, chicken. But she's become a minister of insects. She's put insects on the menu in her ministry. So that's a very important step. In the beginning, companies that were rearing insects were not considered farmers. They had no entry at the ministry, now they do. So why not eat insects? I'm trying to convince people at different places, and especially in the last three years it went very fast. Three years ago we had a big festival in Wageningen, where we had 1,750 people, 1,747, who all together ate insects at the same time at the same place, from the same source. You can eat them too, today. We have some insects being well prepared for you. They've been prepared by several companies, companies that are combined in an association of insect rearing companies for human consumption, that teamed up with a strawberry producer, someone from the chocolate makers, and they made a very nice bonbon. 
and you're all invited to join. I can't offer them to every one of you, so I'm going to offer the first one, just like you do with the first herring. I'm going to do the first one, well, not to a prince, but to Joris. <laughs> and after that, there will be one for you all. So I'd say, enjoy.